Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another stream. Welcome to another day. Another topic that needs to be covered. Uh, well, it doesn't need to be covered, does it? Um, but uh, you know, we're here and we're we're covering topics, which is good. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, work for, workforce performance. Um, about you know how do we measure efficiency performance in workplaces and things like that so um not something which again i feel like at the minute we keep saying and saying uh, the the sort of entrance to every every stream is uh, the fact that uh, you know it's not going to be an overly complicated one but um i feel like we've th there is a couple of meaty topics coming up um uh, but uh, just just you know these are quite get you the information you can do your books you can you can do some exercise in them and, and that should be it really there's no need to, to to really keep going on about them um we've got the news I, I, I just had a quick scan of the news just afterwards uh sorry before this and uh for, for afterwards and uh there is a couple of weird stuff um going on at the minute uh so we can have a look at that and and, and see what's what um sometimes we we manage to clock things which i haven't even seen though um <laughs> Because it's it's so new, um, which is quite nice for me as well. Actually, it keeps me informed. I'm the most informed I've ever been. I don't tend to watch, watch the news very much. Um, definitely not looking at it daily like this. Um, it's quite depressing, isn't it? Try to keep my spirits up. Um, <laughs> I suppose that what's that? What does that say about the world? Anyway, uh, let's get on to some um, some business and do some um, some workforce performance. Here we go. So welcome to the pack. And um, yeah, so workforce performance, um, again, as I said, not something that's that's a massive, massive topic, but it is an important topic and it is something that's uh, that businesses need to be aware of and need to be uh, monitoring and, and looking over as well. Remember, no point of setting um, aims if we don't uh, review them and there's no point of reviewing stuff if we didn't set the aims in the first place. It's very difficult to review anything if we've never set the aims in the first place. So um, yeah, everything goes hand in hand, really. A bit of a spider's web of stuff. Why won't it let me do that? Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, okay, so learning objectives for the day. Let's have a look at what we're going to have a look at. It says, explain what is meant by workforce performance. Explain what is meant by labour productivity, absenteeism, and labour turnover. Hopefully some of these things you're going, yeah, I already know this stuff. Great. That'd be perfect. Uh, calculate and interpret labour turnover and labour productivity and evaluate the performance and impact of the workforce performance for a business and its stakeholders, as always. All right. So what is workforce performance then? So workforce performance measures how productive in terms of output a firm is based on the human resources it has. Now, when we talk about human resources, although we haven't covered them again yet, because we covered them earlier on in the year, uh, but although we haven't done the revision for them yet, um, and the cat's... Uh, Trying to get involved. What are you doing? He doesn't care, does he? Go on then. Get off. Yeah, go on. He comes in before the stream starts. He comes in and sits on the window. I don't know how he knows. And even the other day when I did the stream late because something else happened, um, he was in here waiting. I was thinking, how the hell do you know that I was about to stream? But he did. Anyway... <laughs> Um, so, yeah, even though we've not talked about um, human resources yet, um, and uh, I just wanted to draw your attention back to human resources. Remember what human resources are. It's the in, it's the physical implementation of, of humans, isn't it? It's the physical implementation of the workforce, uh, the training, the motivation, the um, efficiencies of the workforce. That's what we class as human resources. And, and there's a whole topic on that whole uh, subsection of the spec uh, devoted to it. Um, and and special, you know, in business, there's there's professionalisms that are completely just HR. Um, so you know, you might be interested in it. I've always wondered. I, I've always thought I might might like to work in HR. I thought I might be uh, interested in that. I've never done it, but um, I thought it might be interesting. Uh, you know, like conflict resolution and stuff like that, or starting conflicts, which I'm even better at. Um, but anyway, yeah, so make sure that you, you know, adequately and efficiently using the, the human resources you've got. Output refers to the number of units produced. Um, therefore, more units produced, the more productive the firm. Quite easy, isn't it? The more we do, the more happy, the more efficient, the more productive we are. 
Um, so productivity itself. So the more productive the firm is, the more output it will have to sell. Now, a bit of AO4 here. What does it rely on? Well, it relies on um, demand, doesn't it? And if you remember, demand is what we are willing and able to um, to buy in terms of, you know, that's why Ferrari doesn't have unlimited um, demand because uh, the target market doesn't have... Um, sorry the you know everybody in the country doesn't have the willingness and ableness to buy it so it relies on that so your AO4 for this when you're talking about productivity is the situation which you've got to think oh well wait a minute uh what about um you know demand because if there's no demand for it then there's no point of doing it is there or there's no you know there's no ability to uh, to do it. it is yeah okay so the more units to uh to sell will mean the more uh, revenue they're, they're capable of receiving. Remember, dependent on uh, the ability to to actually sell them, the the, uh, the demand for the product and things like that. Um, although it must be remembered that there needs to be a demand for the product, as I said, all right. Um, why measure productivity? Well, why measure anything? Um, well, mainly um, to measure overall performance. It's very difficult to measure performance in general, especially for a business, um, because there's so many moving parts. So usually we have to break it down into, well, let's let's um, measure this bit, let's measure this bit, having personal goals, having corporate aims and things like that. And if you remember, right, 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 right back at the start of the course, uh, we talked about the different levels of, of aims and objectives where you have your corporate aims, then you have your, uh, you know, divisional aims and you have your... Um, you know, department aims and then personal aims and things like that. That's very much about this, isn't it? So why do, it's difficult to measure productivity? It is because um, you know, everybody's doing their own thing. Everybody's got different skills and abilities. It's, it's not really fair to measure each other against each other all the time, um, or even department against department. So sometimes we we measure the productivity. We measure the ability to for them to to meet their um their aims and objectives, you know, whichever ones that we, we specifically um, put in for them, essentially. Okay. So it measures the efficiency of its workforce. We call this labor productivity and helps identify areas for improvement. Really important that we, we constantly look to improve ourselves and improve our departments, doesn't it? So labor productivity first. Labor productivity is the measurement of the efficiency with which a firm's labor force, or what we call an input. Remember, the input is in what we physically are doing, uh, generates output over a given time period. So uh, how efficient are you at changing inputs, whether it is physical movements, whether it is a skill, whether it's an ability, whether it is for, uh, specifically changing something, uh, you know, a piece of paper into a painting or whatever it is, how efficient are you at changing a resource, an input to an output? That's what it is. It measures the output or per worker over a given period. All right. Now, it's really important that you use uh, the terminology in the exam. Um, the amount of times I see students like doing uh, explanations that are really convoluted and and um, you know uh, they they just they just don't work properly because they haven't used one business term which would explain the whole thing. Like opportunity cost is a good one. Opportunity cost is quite a complicated thing to to explain um, until you know the definition. And once you use the definition, it's dead easy. So, you know, try and learn these things. Use the terminology if you can, because it's going to it's gonna save you so much time of having to explain yourself in the exam. Oh, yeah, well, it means this, blah, 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 blah. Let me do that. You know, let me be convoluted. Let me be, uh, be uh, you know, different about that, because that's what my job is, isn't it? To try and uh, explain it in terms that aren't using the, the phrases, because you might not know them. You should know the phrases. You can use them in the exam. So use that terminology. So it says... It must say efficiency, use the word efficiency because that's essentially what we're talking about and must specifically refer to over a period of time as well. So if you're doing a definition in the exam, really make sure that you talk about the efficiency and over a period of time. It's not just infinite. Now, what is the formula for it? This is the formula for it. So it's the total output per period of time, average number of employees um, over a period of time. Okay, so it's really, really simple. Basically, what we're doing is we're dividing up... Um, how much we've done by how many people have done it. That's it, really. Um, so total output per period of time, uh, 100. Uh, average number of employees per period of time, 10. Um, so we divide them up, then you've got, you know, 10, haven't you? So what we're saying is we've got, you know, each person here um, per week or per month or however long it is you're doing it is making 10 products or whatever it is that we're talking about. All right, so really, really simple. Just divide up what you're doing by how many people are doing it, you get your labor productivity, all right? 
Now, problems with using labour productivity in terms of uh, A or 4, if you want to have a jab at it, if you want to have a bit of discussion on it, which employees should be counted? It's an important one, this one, isn't it? So how, in terms of, we know it's difficult to, um, should it be managers? Should it be uh, only people who are on the shop floor? Should it be people who are working on uh, marketing campaigns? Should it be people who are working on the phones? Um should it be people who aren't, aren't customer facing and, and are working on, I don't know, IT systems? Should they be? Like, oh, uh, how many Excel spreadsheets have you made over the last, um, you know, six weeks? Oh, I've made 10. All oh, right, well, 10 divided by the hour. It doesn't work, does it? Because there, there, there are um, there is a significant amount of work here that doesn't really apply to this. So the only way it really works is if you've got a, a definitive output that you can really divide up by the input. And in which case, if you can do that, Again, you've still got to look at it in circumstance because things like Excel spreadsheets wouldn't work, would it? Streams. Oh, what's what's Ryan's um, labor productivity for streams at one a day? All right, well, that's not good enough because he, he's wasting all his other time, even though he's doing other stuff. It, you know, he's wasting all his other time because he could be more efficient at doing it. He could be doing 100 streams a day. Uh, you know, so it doesn't really work. And it does also doesn't take into account time for things as well, does it? How long does it take to do something and how efficient, how important is that job to the overall process? You might only need, and demand as well, you might only need one thing happening. Um, if you were to do 100, it wouldn't matter because it doesn't help. So um, how should part-time workers be counted? Should we divide it up again by two? Should we be saying, oh, well, we don't actually count these people? Should we be saying, well, we'll, we'll, we'll count them as double? Or should we make some kind of inference about what they would be doing if they were in full-time? Uh, should employees on long-term sick be included? Because they are part of the workforce, aren't they? And it will affect the efficiency of the company as well. But again, what's the point of doing this? I think that's what you've got to keep in mind for this, haven't you? Um, if you were to use that kind of information, yes, you would be more correct. You would be more, um, your precision would be better. You would be more specific, but it would be a case of, well, what's the point? Unless you got loads of people on long-term sick and you were trying to figure out how much of an impact it had on the business. But I don't know what you're going to do about it because I, I wouldn't try and go down that, that um, you know, prickly uh, field of trying to sack people who are long term sick i don't think it would be a, a very sensible move to make but you know what i'm not a, a successful business person am i so you know what do i know all right what can we do to uh, improve that labor productivity well we do a couple of things first of all um, reduce absenteeism do you remember absenteeism is people not going to work it can be for any number of reasons it can be because of illness it can be because of you know not wanting to be there it can be because of mental health issues could be for a number of reasons for that really important, really damages companies because it, it affects our ability to um, meet demand, meet targets, meet, you know, be in meetings or whatever it is that we need to do. Imagine if, uh, you know, absenteeism in, in, in education is a really big one uh, because if I'm ill, uh, which I really am, it's funny actually, this year um, I've been more ill this year than, than I can remember. Um, and I think it's probably because of having a kid um i'm run down all the time i don't sleep properly so <laughs> i think it's that um but if it, so my, my immune system will be down a little bit but if i'm off um it affects you know it could affect like 100 people because uh, or more because you've got and, and and sort of secondary as well so i know that i i i always make an effort even if you know not to infect other people and stuff like that but if i can get in i do get in because ultimately um i don't want to be impacting on those at least you know um 60 or 70 students i see a day you know um or more you know probably more on an average day to be honest but uh, you know whereas so i would have a massive impact if one student is off that doesn't have that much impact it has an impact on them but it doesn't have that much impact on on the world does it whereas if i'm if i'm ill it does have a massive impact because all those other people aren't going to see me they're gonna have to do it we're gonna have to organize cover for it we're gonna have to do all these different things it just makes a mess so it's just a case of what can we do to, to really um, sort of affect that, can we? And, and try and, how do we get people to, to think like me in terms of, I'll try and get in if I can, all right? Um, I think it might be different on the other side of this lockdown, though, people, how, how people feel about that, because it really frustrates me that when people come in and they're coughing and spluttering all over the place. Stay at home. If you need to be at home, stay at home. Do not come into work and cough all over me, and then I'm ill. Great. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> that's just how I feel. Um 
second one increase motivation we talked about motivation techniques we're going to go back onto them in a couple of lessons time but if you remember can we can uh, motivate people using money we can use you know um offers in terms of promises we can use uh, you know congratulations we can use uh, a range of techniques can't we to make them feel better um, and make them want to come to work give them opportunities and things like that multi-skilled workers so that if someone was off we can always move the the workforce around remember it's called uh, job enrichment or um, job enlargement in terms of if it's enlargement you have the movement if it's enrichment you, you make the job more interesting maybe give it more autonomy more authority whatever it is we're trying to do uh, technological improvements um, can we make the job easier can we make the job more exciting can we give them an ipad can we give them things one of the things which i've seen more recently and in, in um physical production is the use of google glass i don't know if you've seen google glass but it was these little uh you know um virtual reality glasses things then or augmented reality because you didn't you could kind of see the world but it would change it would like put put something on the world for you so you, you'd be able to see um you know a video or whatever but it's beamed straight onto your eye um and um it didn't work to be honest it was a bit of a failed product for google it was a bit of a um i think it was just beyond uh, just just a bit ahead of its time and it didn't really work that well it was the batteries which kept it down um but they've been sort of relaunched in the uh, production um industries and um people have been using them so if you're interested have a little google on have a little google of google glass um in production and see what people have been doing because it's uh it's pretty impressive you know and shows what p potential that product could have had as well if we'd have uh, really really taken it to you know its natural conclusion i'd be interested in it i'd be well interested in trying that um they're just too they're just crazy expensive that's why i never got them <laughs> Uh, flexible working practices as well, allowing people to come part time, job share, that kind of stuff, you know, allow people to, to be more efficient. Um, okay, so let's just go through these really, really quickly, um, just to give you some definitions and stuff like that. Um, absenteeism is the number of the staff absent as a percentage of the total number of staff employed. Absenteeism is the, num uh, is the problem for all businesses for a number of reasons. Let's have a look at those reasons. Um, prolonged absences can lead to major disruption if the worker is a key in a particular area or um, a new project. Can you think of that? Yeah, it would be a real problem, wouldn't it? We'd have to divvy up the work between other people. Um, if production is delayed or there are problems with quality, then customers can be lost. So it can affect the reputation of the place. Uh, absenteeism can be demotivating to staff left to cope with the problems. Yes, it can. And I've definitely been in that process myself when there's been people off for a long period of time and you've got to try and pick up the um pick up the slack when you are busy anywhere but it's just the way it is sometimes you know we, we all have to pull together uh the higher the rate of absenteeism the more likely it is that workers will re will re be, you know say they're ill and um, this is because culture of absenteeism will develop uh where it'll become acceptable for workers to take extra days holiday by reporting in sick um i've worked with people before that said that that uh Oh well, um, my sick allowance of two weeks or whatever it is 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 an extra two weeks holiday for me, so I always take it. Well, you know, <laughs> what can I say to that? You will get that, and that's to develop the culture, isn't it? That you're trying to develop a culture that people want to go to work or people like being at work. And if you get something like Google, um, they try to the nth degree, don't they? Where they make they they make it so that you'd never want to leave, which is a little bit creepy. But on an average job. I think that a lot of it is to do with if you're doing things like that, if you're pulling stunts like that, you shouldn't be in that job. Just change jobs. If you if you feel so negative about it, if you're trying to take days off because say you're ill when you're not, you know, grow up and change jobs. If you're in education, grow up and and uh, you know like uh, go and go and do some work because it's such a small part of your life in in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, don't don't be an idiot about it because. You, you're screwing yourself on in the future there so just just be be aware of it um i haven't got the energy today i've been up uh, in the night i haven't got the energy in it today to uh to sort of argue about it but uh you know i do feel more passionate about it than, than I'm, I'm making out um rates of absenteeism can be useful for a business to calculate as they can be compared to industry or national averages they can also be compared between one part of a business and another and compared all the time so we can do some benchmarking, can't we? And we can do internal benchmarking as well if there's a, a part of the company which is specifically good about, you know, how often. Although, um, I worked at a college and they had someone who hadn't had a day off in like, it was something ridiculous, like 25 years or something like that. You know, uh, they, they'd had all the holidays and everything that they would have done. Um, but they, they also had, uh, yeah, uh, 
they, they, they hadn't. And they gave them something like an Argos voucher. And I thought, give them a day off. <laughs> give them a week off. Take them, send them on holiday. You know, so I suppose that the the you know reward for doing something so significant as that has to be quite you know equally significant to warrant people being interested in it doesn't it um so let's have a look at the absentees and formula the absentees and formula is here it's total number of staff uh, ab absence uh, days per period of time so how many ta how, how much absence has there been uh, divided by the total number of days that could have been worked so the total so you've got what happened over the total times 100 assumption that'll give you a percentage of uh, absenteeism um it's a it's an important one that um because it can be sort of quite confusing can't it in terms of um what he's actually doing but it's the same as the um the labor productivity but this is a percentage so it's the total number of absence uh days over a period of time divided by the total number of working days so what what did happen divided by what could have happened times 100 and that'll give you a percentage of what we actually did um okay so remember the reason why it wouldn't do that on labor productivity if i just draw your attention back to this one the the reason that this wouldn't do it is because we're talking about number of things that you did you know so it's not a percentage it's not talking about capacity utilization or anything like that it's talking about the number of things we've done so if you did as i said you know 100 things 10 people uh, that means they did 10 each okay uh, whereas on this one uh, we're talking about the percentage of absenteeism oh, so the amount of people who are um, absent from the job at any one time okay so whoops so why would a business like uh, absenteeism to be high or low so sorry would uh, a business like absenteeism to be high or low we could get that in, in, in an exam uh two two marks they would like it to be low, wouldn't they? Because um, productivity will decrease. It means that people are having to change the jobs. People are having to come away with from what they're doing because they'd have to cover people who aren't there. Um, there is no real benefit. The only time absenteeism could be high. Uh, in fact, no, it wouldn't because uh, it, absenteeism is never a good thing. You know, uh, I suppose if you're having problems with cash flow, you could benefit from high absenteeism. But I, I worry that uh, it wouldn't really be classed as absenteeism then, would it? Uh, absenteeism would be if you'd didn't want them to be away or they, they've just taken it on their own, their own accord to take some time off not that you've given them some time off and things like that It'd just be called leave wouldn't it um give three benefits of lower absenteeism levels uh, you've got increased productivity i mean you've got good uh, better capacity utilization um you've got hopefully increased customer satisfaction levels because of the quality and because of um things like that anything like that's totally fine remember that's one of the brilliant things about businesses as long as you can justify it and, it and it comes across as reasonable a lot of the time they'll give you the marks for it um in which industries might you expect a high absenteeism rate well have a think about that for a second but the ones i would think about are your uh, you know uh, supermarket work your low skill low low paid stuff uh takeaways um yeah supermarket takeaways that kind of stuff anywhere that you th that people aren't really seeing that as a career they're seeing it as just a job um not to say that, they, that, that there's some people who don't see it as a career but lots of people see it as a bit of pin money and are not bothered you know oh yeah i'll just say i'm ill blah 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 if a thousand staff are employed um, and 30 are absent on a particular day then what is the rate of absenteeism for that working day so all you've got to do if i just didn't bring you back to this one total number of staff uh, absence days over a period of time so what have we got uh, so 30 uh, divided by a thousand times a hundred should we do it let's do it so we've got 30 divided by a thousand times by a hundred that is an absentee uh, absenteeism rate of three percent okay That'd be really good. That amazing, um, really really low uh, absenteeism, which is good. Okay, labour turnover. So let's say people leave. All right. So about people um, leaving a job and, and having to replace people. So labour or staff turnover is another measure of personal effectiveness. Uh, it measures the rate in which employees are leaving an organisation, and the the formula for that is your number of leaving uh, of staff leaving per period of time uh, divided by the average number of staff employed times one hundred. Okay. Can you see a um, <laughs> you know a repeating thing now? They're quite similar, aren't they? So for example, if twenty staff left over a year and there were an average of forty staff then the staff turnover would be 50 percent, wouldn't it okay now with this i know that students get a bit confused about the average thing um usually they don't ask you to, to work it out they'll just tell you 
Um, so don't get worried about the the word average in terms of the average number of staff employed. You know, they're not going to say that potentially, I suppose you could be asked to do an average of in January, they had this many in February, they had this money, but usually they just say, oh no, there's, uh, there's 200 staff. So you, you think, all right, well, it must be 200 staff. The average is 200 then. So just take it, use the easiest thing, use the simplest answer because um, I know people get confused with this one. And it confused me when I was looking at it. I was thinking, average, what, why is it average? It doesn't say average. So, yeah. Okay, so number of staff leaving over a period of time. So how many people have left the business uh, over the amount of people who are usually employed there? So in essentially the total amount of people who are employed uh, times 100, it will give you your percentage. All right. Uh, so as with other measures of workforce performance, labour turnover differs from the department to department within a business, from business to business within an industry, and from industry to industry within the economy. Uh, it depends on the business, doesn't it? So you could tell me, you know, your low skill, low wage jobs that we talked about are probably going to have people come and go, especially if they're, if they're dealing with sub, um, if they're working with people like students who are maybe going to university um, and things like that. They're going to have people leave and they're going to have people come back and they're going to have people, you know, it's going to change, isn't it? Uh, depending on perhaps even seasonality. Um, it's unlikely that businesses which are extremely seasonal are going to keep you on the books all year round. Um, they'll probably just recruit as and when they need them, in which case their staff turnover would be quite high, wouldn't it? Labor turnover would be quite high. Uh, whereas other ones would probably be quite low, people who are quite comfortable in their jobs and don't change for a very long time. I think labor turnover for, for, for teachers, I don't know, just draw your attention to, um, to, to an example thing, but labor turnover in teaching is in incredibly high. Because uh, if you think about it, from you as a, a student, have you had a teacher leave? Have you had a new teacher join the course halfway through? Most people are probably not in the head because um, most people have. I definitely I have multiple times. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things of um, there are certain industries that, that, that have a lot more... Um, labor turnover than others uh, some some you'll see people work there for years and years and years and it used to be more so it used to be more acceptable that uh, you would stay in a job all your life but i think that's uh, that's definitely not the case now people like to change people get bored quite easily and and want to do other things uh, so low pay why why do people uh, do this then so low pay is a good example of it can lead to high labor turnovers as workers want to have better paid jobs so you're always trying to uh, better yourself uh, limited training or promotional opportunities will encourage workers to leave their current job so it's important as an employer to be saying right okay what can we do for this person what can we do to to push them up the ranks what can we do to bring them on because if you don't then they'll find someone else who will give them that promotion Poor working conditions or low job satisfaction, uh, workplace bullying can be major factors, that kind of stuff. Remember, and we don't mean, we don't always mean workplace bullying as in like a really negative um, thing. We could just mean there's a clash of, in, uh, clash of, excuse me, personalities as well. Can be a reason why people uh, leave jobs and, and stuff like that. And it's just that, you know, uh, that way. Sometimes it's just not right for people, is it? Uh, poor recruitment and selection can lead to the wrong type of employees being hired. This can lead to workers leaving shortly after being employed as they're not suited to the needs of the business. I hear loads and loads of stuff about this, about people begging the wrong people for the jobs. And I've definitely been involved with recruitment processes before where you think, yeah, the only reason that you've you've employed them is because it's a woman or a man or you know they're really good looking or blah 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 and you think they're never going to last because <laughs> just because you're infatuated with the person when it doesn't mean that they were the right person for the job you know like and and this is what happens in real life you know people make silly decisions in, in recruitment and selection and that's why with bigger businesses um they have stringent hr policy which tries to minimize that or having a range of people because if one person's in charge of it um you know um i i, I a guy who decides that he wants to um, surround himself with really good looking women uh, well if you're a really good looking woman you'll probably have a good chance of getting the job then but if for everyone else um doesn't mean the really good looking woman is is good or bad at the job we have no idea but it shouldn't really be be based on their looks whether they're getting the job unless they're being a model or something like that isn't it directly linked to the actual job as i said it happens so you know uh, if you are really good looking then you will have a, a, an advantage i've always found that i've had a massive advantage over other people because of how good looking i am anyway <laughs> so problems of high turnover uh, recruiting new staff can be costly we know how expensive it is um to to recruit staff and to keep them and keep training them because remember it's not only the physical cost but it's the it's the re um it's the cost of uh, reputation and things like that that's that's lost if we if we keep changing staff i know that my um 
my parents when they go to shops are always saying oh yeah you, you never see the same person twice and it's annoying and when you do like in some shops i know morrison specifically we've seen quite the same staff for quite a long time and it's nice it's nice that you get to see the same people i know why should it matter why should it matter that you get the same people but it does and it's nice to see the same people sometimes so we've got to they must be doing something right in terms of that but recruiting new staff can be expensive a constant stream of new workers require training and induction to the business we've already been in through induction training haven't we remember on the job off the job training um and it's very expensive for time and money of um i think he's the cat's running around the house what are you doing go on man He's like he's the less he's the least gracious cat I've ever seen. He's like he just thunders around the house. You think cats are supposed to be like you know really <laughs> soft treading, aren't they? But not not my cat. He's he thinks he's a dog. He's like sprinting around the house at the minute. I don't know what he's seen as well over the last couple of days. He's been really funny. He's been like running around the house, going crazy, especially like bit late at night. It's like he's watching something. It's quite creepy at night. <laughs> Anyway, so if posts uh, are filled internally, then someone leaves the uh, leaves. This creates future uh, future vacancies, further vacancies rather. So imagine if um, you know you leave and I replace you, then there's going to be someone who needs to do my job or vice versa, isn't there? So it's important to remember that there isn't just an infinite number of people uh, to replace or backfill and things like that. Um, benefits of high turnover, okay, so th this is not always a bad thing. Uh, new staff can bring new ideas and experience, can't they? It's a good time to get new people in sometimes, um, especially when they've worked with competitors or other businesses and things like that. Some workers may be ineffective, and it's better for productivity for the business to, th to get rid of those people or, or they encourage them to get rid of them. Um, not always the case, and you always you get these people who are terrible at jobs and, and are able to continue getting other jobs, and, and for the, it's crazy sometimes that, that this happens, but it does. Uh, where a business pays low wages or where working conditions are poor, it may be more profitable to have a consistent or constant turnover of staff rather than uh, raise wages or improve conditions of work. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy situation, isn't it? I think in longevity of the business, it's not necessarily... He's looking at birds. I can see he's looking at birds. Um, it's not always the uh, most sort of PC thing to say, but in terms of this... Uh, yeah, you know, if we looked at it from a pure business perspective, uh, sometimes it's it's cheaper to to keep the conditions rubbish, but at least um, uh, and let people come and go. Now he's fully right. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm trying to stream. Right. <laughs> Okay, so which industries would likely to be naturally have a high turnover? Again, low, low skill, low wage jobs are more likely to. Uh, the jobs with seasonality, like I said, uh, are more likely to have that. That um, same with absenteeism, they they very they very much go hand in hand, um, and as well, you know, things like in foreign countries. I bet if you had, uh, you know. Uh, the, the places where they, they they do production jobs and things like that but they're very very low skill uh, sorry very very low wage jobs not necessarily low skill that, that in foreign countries either um are probably going to come and go if they can um, you know consistently uh, why would a business want low um labor turnover well you know it's cheaper if we have low, low lower labor turnover it's um it's uh, what are you doing stop distracting me um and um yeah low, uh, sorry it'd, uh, it'd lead to you know it'd be wouldn't be it wouldn't be soaking up profits would it, it would be cheaper for the company it would enable a, a consistency across the quality of the company and things like that but you can hear his bell as well can't you what are you doing what are you doing are you okay anyway um so there's a little task in your book if you want to have a go at that one Okay, so let's have a little look at the shareholders. Uh, let's have a look at the stakeholders essentially here. So benefits to stakeholders of improving workforce performance. Uh, shareholders improved efficiency will tend to lower costs and raise profits. With greater profits, shareholders will be paid higher dividends and high, higher share prices. Businesses will also uh, have more profit to reinvest. This could help the long term future of the business. So important that one, isn't it? You know, like... Um, from a from a stakeholder perspective, there isn't going to be many stakeholders that are going to be unhappy with your um your positive you know uh, 
labour turnover and, and low absenteeism levels and things like that, other than your, 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 your competitors, obviously, because they're going to love that if you're doing less efficiency, you know, you'll be less efficient, therefore it's costing you more money and, and your competitive advantage is less. Um, second is customers. Improved workforce performance will help reduce costs. Businesses will then be able to offer products at lower prices. Customers will also benefit from the quality of the products are improved. Bit of AO4, remember, that's on the assumption that we actually do reduce prices and we pass on the savings to the customer. We don't always have to. We could just make more profit, retain profit, and, and satisfy those stake, uh, shareholders a little bit more. Employees and managers, a workforce that performs at a higher standard may also be more motivated and increase job uh, satisfaction. They may also be more valued by employers, uh, get better training, be given more opportunities to use their talents and enjoy a better working relationships with their employers. So just benefits in general, just really, really good. Um, government, uh, a business which has highly skilled, motivated and efficient workforce is, is, is more likely to be efficient overall. Uh, efficiency should get them higher profits, therefore lead to the government gaining more tax revenues and they have that, um, that security of the jobs as well, don't they? All right. So... Uh, in terms of, we're going to have a little look at our past paper question, just really, really quickly. And I've gone quite quick today, haven't we? But the Mars Corporation is guided by five principles. An extract from the UK uh, Mars website relating to efficiency principles is set out below. It says, our strength is lies in our efficiency, our ability to organise all our assets, physical, financial and human, for maximum productivity. In this way, our products and services are made and delivered with the highest quality, at least uh, with the least possible cost, with the lowest consumption of resources. All right. So the question is, what is labour productivity and how might it be measured? Productivity, so let's have a look at these then. We'd have a four marker here. Let's give the definition. Productivity is a measurement of the efficiency with the firm that turns production into uh, inputs into outputs. Remember, we said that right at the start. Uh, can be measured by dividing the output uh, per period by the number of workers employed. Um, there you are. So you've got, if you mention the output per worker and over time, you get that. So ultimately, definition, little explanation of how, and literally an explanation, two marks for the definition, little explanation of, of what the, the actual formula says, and you're good to go. So if we had a look at the um, another one here, we've got explain the possible methods uh, which businesses such as um, Mars might use to exp uh, improve their productivity. Now, in terms of this, let's have a little look at the AOs. Is there any AO1? Uh, the possible methods, I think, yeah. Uh, I think because we've got the improve the productivity bit, we've got the AO1. Uh, such as Mars means that there's no AO2, um, but it mentions businesses, so we could put some, we're going to have to apply it. Uh, AO3 in there because it says explain. Uh, AO4, have we got any discussion? No. So I reckon in this one, AO1, AO2, AO3. So explain what it is and put it in context to an extent um, because it's businesses such as Mars. You're still going to have to talk about businesses of some kind, so big, small, you know, new um, well-established things like this so let's just have a look at this it says candidate briefly outlines one or two methods that businesses uh, such as mars might use to improve their productivity um so in terms of this remember you've got your absenteeism rates you've got your benchmarking you've got your uh, training you've got your hr policy you've got your uh, the various things that we've talked about today number two it says candidate attempts to explain at least two methods of the businesses such as mars might use to improve their productivity now it mentions here doesn't it um, businesses such as Mars it's not asking you specifically about Mars but you do need to give some context to it big businesses, small businesses, whatever and then level 3 uh, candidate fully explains uh, methods that businesses such as Mars might use so in terms of this uh, you'd be looking at for all three when you're talking about absenteeism rates and talking about productivity and talking about things like that, efficiencies and things like that Okay, ladies and gents. So um, that brings us to the end of that one. I know we're going quite fast through these because it's they're not massive topics, so it's it, that's why we're we have an ability to, to to sort of go faster on them. Let's have a little look at the news. Um, keep you well informed. Uh, now this one, I saw this one. Um, have a quick look at this one. Remember, in the future, you can have a look at these and go, "Oh yeah, do you remember when that all happened." Um, worldwide COVID-19 death toll is now above 250,000. Uh, Nigeria, India and Israel are among the latest countries to start easing restrictions. Um, that, that's worrying actually because of the amount of people who live in those countries. The US records 1,015 deaths in 24 hours, the lowest one day tally in a month. Yeah, it's still a lot though, isn't it? 1,000 people, that's 1,000 families, that's 1,000 lots of people who are, have been affected by this, and that's just, just that day. Um, 
while the US Treasury will borrow a record three trillion between April and June. It's kind of put all this austerity and that into uh, into <laughs> into perspective now, really, hasn't it? UK sales plunged to the lowest level since 1946. Okay, let's have a look at this one. It says. Uh, new car registrations almost ground to a halt in April after coronavirus lockdown measures were introduced, the motor industry has said. Figures from the industry body, the SMMT, show that only 4,321 cars were registered, the lowest monthly since 1946. April's um, figure marked a 97% plunge in sales from the same month last year. The closure of car dealerships as part of the measures to try and combat these diseases hit consumer registrations. The Society for Motor uh, Manufacturers and Traders said that the registrations made last month, 70% were made by companies buying for their fleets. The cars will more likely be on the on order before lockdown, said Mike Hawes, the chief executive. If you were told to close all your car showrooms for the entirety of April, it's no surprise that the sales are almost non-existent. Many of the 4,000 cars sold last month were needed to support key workers and those who had pressing need for them. So if you have a look, wow, <laughs> look at that. That's impressive, isn't it? That's a good graph. So if you can see, you know, we've got a little bit of negativity here and, and, you know, it does happen sometimes where we don't have loads, but that is incredible, isn't it? Um, think of the think of the benefits that we're going to see when we go out of it, though. Um, okay. Let's have a look at the business news. A widely watched economic survey shows that the dominant services sector all but stalled last month. Hmm. This, yeah. Listen, they can open, but I don't know if people are going to go. The boss of one of the UK's biggest change, uh, cinema chains is hopeful that the business will come open in mid-July. View Cinema's chief executive Tim Richard told the BBC that he's taken, talking to the authorities about social distancing measures. Uh, but if all goes to plan, the chain could be back in business for the launch of director Christopher Nolan's action movie Tenet. Um... On the 17th of July, he said, we can control how many people come into our cinemas. The coronavirus lockdown forced the closure of cinemas in the UK and, mid uh, and elsewhere in the world. We are seeing the markets in Europe before mar before ours. We're trying to work with other government to demonstrate that we are not uh, like sporting fixtures and pop concerts. We can control how many people come into our cinemas at one time. We have the ability to control the exit and entrance. Mm, I, I think it's this is the problem with it you see people aren't thinking about the consumer um psychology that goes around with it. it's the same as when there's a recession it's not the actual recession which is the problem the damaging thing is the fact that it's consumer spending habits it's the fact that people don't feel comfortable being in that situation they've got out of a habit um it says here cinemas he said were a big part of the uk's so social fabric and research pointed to film going as one of the main activities people wanted to do after lockdown is lifted Really? Because loads of people don't go anywhere. I, don't, I still don't think it's a massive thing. Closure of cinemas in many countries meant some movies were released simultaneously on streaming platforms. Uh, the dual release of Trolls World Tour caused a huge dispute between Audion and Film Studio Universal, but Mr. Richards did not see this way of releasing films becoming a trend. The big screen was still how people preferred to see big releases. He had sympathy with Universal over the release of Trolls. They'd already invested heavily in marketing and promotion, and suddenly they had no screens to show it on. What Universal did does not mean that there is a new direction of travel. We are not seeing uh, any change, he said. Well, I disagree. I think they've been very clear about the fact that there is a that there is a change. And I think the fact that he's saying that is is a complete... He's just, he's just trying to be nice, isn't he? Which is not realistic. Uh, we've got this one here. It says, uh, the nursery I run may not survive. This is an issue. Um, Zoe Ray says that she might have to shut her nursery. We might not be able to get through at least... Um, we might be able to get through at least an. A, we might be able to get through at least. Oh, sorry. We <laughs> we might be able to last another two months. I was thinking at least another two months. It doesn't make sense. But without more help, we won't last longer. Says Zoe Ray. Uh, Zoe Ray, who uh, owns Goldsmiths Community Nursery in South East London. She typically caters to thirty children, but since lockdown began, she has fallen to just three after providers were told they should only stay open for families of key workers. Her income has slumped. So she's put 10 of her staff on paid leave, partly using the government's coronavirus job retention scheme. Um, it's a massive issue. I think the government should do more help to, um, to do more to help nurseries. They asked us to stay open for key workers, and I think that's the right thing to do morally, but the support doesn't cover our costs. Well, it doesn't cover the costs anyway. We looked into this. We looked into running a nursery, and it isn't viable. You know, the... the, uh, the, the, the 
the government changed it so much that uh, they made it so that you get all these free hours and stuff, and the hours that they give, the money that they give you per per student isn't worth it. So I, I think that this is a dying industry anyway, to be honest. I, th- I don't know what we're going to do about it because it's a necessary industry, but, you know... Um, yeah, it's a difficult one. Okay, last one. Let's have a look at the last thing today. Um, German top court criticizes ECB crisis bond buying. Government pays nearly quarter of worker wages. Uh, yeah, talk about um, what well, they're always saying. Isn't it? Foreign countries were always saying we're like uh, communism. We're like communists because we have the NHS and stuff like that. Um, we we very much are like that today when we're paying all these wages and things like that. Ooh. Okay, we'll finish with this one, I think. Gold's Gym files for bankruptcy protection. That's a very famous gym. Uh, gym chain Gold's has become the, the latest big name to file for bankruptcy protection as it struggles with the impacts of coronavirus lockdowns. The company said it's the move would uh, mean the permanent closure of 30 company-owned gyms. More than 700 gyms operate around the world under the Gold's brand, most of which are franchises. Uh, in the latest big name to, to file for bankruptcy during the global efforts to slow the spread of the virus. This has been a complete and total disruption of every one of our business norms, so we need to take twi- quick, de- decisive actions to enable us to get on track, Chief Executive Adam Zaitseth said in a video statement. Fair play. He's also moved to reassure customers and employees that the company plan to emerge from bankruptcy protection by August, if not sooner, adding we're absolutely going nowhere. So it's an interesting one, isn't it, to be able to, to do this kind of thing and whether you know, um, whether people, whether this is the right thing to do, you know, sometimes you need to play the system, don't you? Sometimes you need to, because you want, you need to protect the business. Um, yeah. Okay. So anyway, thank you very much for joining me. I hope it's been useful. I hope you are staying well. I hope to see you tomorrow and we will be going through a new topic. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, I will see you then. Peace.